Okay, folks, so today I'm repairing this cassette I got for super cheap, and I'm also going to be doing some basic calibration in this video, and I'm warning you ahead of time, I had some major, major editing, camera, audio mishaps during this video, so it's going to be a little bit of a mess, but just deal with it, and, you know, let's just move on. Okay, so the cassette deck I got is a Panasonic 612, and... The person I bought it off of told me it probably needed belts. It used to work. It doesn't work anymore, but, you know, it probably just needs belts, and that's it. So I wound up getting it super cheap, and I bought a belt set ahead of time. When I finally got this cassette deck in the mail and opened it up in person, I was pleasantly surprised with the condition that the cassette deck was in. It seemed to be pretty good, and when I opened up inside, everything seemed to be pretty clean. When I went to test it out, I noticed immediately that it's not the belts that are an issue, but there is something else going on that is preventing the tape from playing. Upon further inspection, I realized that the pinch roller is not engaging with the cap stand. And this is extremely hard to show on camera, but the spring that keeps tension on the pinch roller arm is not properly set in its place. And when I first saw this, I assumed that someone must have been servicing this cassette deck. They didn't know how to put it back together, and they kind of just threw everything together and hoping it worked. So anyway, the first step was to take the pinch roller assembly out so I could get take a better look at the um, pinch roller arm as well as the spring. And this is where a little bit of brains are going to have to come in because I have to figure out how this piece is supposed to go back in the machine. And when it comes to this type of stuff, it takes a lot of head scratching, a lot of trial and error, and, you know, sometimes you're lucky and you could get some sort of assembly manual that tells you how everything's supposed to go together. But in this case, I just kind of had to look at it and stare at it enough and realize what was supposed to happen. After a little toying around, I figured out how I think it's supposed to be put back together. And you kind of have to cock the spring um, and kind of put it behind this tab. This way it's spring loaded when you install it back into the transport assembly. And then once it's in its position, you kind of uncock the spring, so to speak. And, um, that's how you get your proper tension. So once I did all that, uh, I did a test and it worked. The, there's now tension on the pinch roller and it seemed to solve that issue. So finally, I could get a tape playing, so I just grabbed a random cassette from my collection, and I pressed play. And immediately, I noticed that I'm only getting sound out of the left channel. So the next step is to figure out why there's no sound coming out of the right channel. And instead of me doing the smart thing and spraying contact cleaner on all the... Um, variable resistors and switches and stuff like that, I just start poking around with the chopstick hoping to find an issue and I wind up wasting an hour until I finally realized huh I should probably spray some contact cleaner clean the the tape heads as well so I wind up doing that and lo and behold that winds up fixing the issue immediately and in most cassette decks there's this sliding switch assembly that um I believe switches the circuit from recording and playback and I'll show this on the camera and this is the third cassette deck that I have repaired that this sliding switch is the culprit of why I'm not getting sound. So I must emphasize, before you do anything on any piece of electrical equipment, spray some contact cleaner on the, the switches, on the potentiometers, you know, th that's the bare basics because if I would have done that immediately, I would have saved myself an hour. Anyway, I got both channels working. To my ears, everything sounded good coming from the cassette I had. And now it was time to just try to record some material on the machine. And I start doing some testing off camera. And the first thing I notice is the high end upon playback is insanely high, which is usually the opposite I'm used to in working cassette. Usually there's a lot of high end loss. So I'm obviously going to need to do some calibration. And while I'm just messing around with the machine and doing some test recordings, a few things start to happen. The tape counter stops working and also the pinch roller assembly becomes inoperable again. 
the spring somehow gets knocked out of his position again, and this immediately makes me rethink my earlier assumption that someone had been working on this and put it together wrong. I think there's just a flaw in the design that makes the spring become um, loose. So obviously I realize this is going to be a problem, so I take the nuclear solution and I just crazy glue the spring into place once I get everything set up, and hopefully that fixes the issue. And as I'm recording this voiceover, that has so far fixed the issue. Um, that crazy glue is holding and the spring is staying in place. To fix the tape counter issue, I wind up swapping out all three belts and I apologize for some reason my camera was not recording. But anyway, after I change out the three belts, the transport system becomes inoperable again. And to make a long story short, the belt that goes around the main capstan motor was just too small and too tight and it was just putting too much stress on the um, bearings. I attempted to stretch it out but that was no use so I just put the old one back on and that one was honestly in pretty good condition anyway so I put that back on and we were back to business. The reverse function of the transport was still a little sluggish and I think the other belts are also a little too small for this machine and once again I tried stretching them out but it didn't really alleviate the issue and honestly it works good enough right now I'll address this issue later once I get the machine calibrated. If anyone knows a reliable way to stretch out cassette belts let me know. Okay so at this point the cassette is in reliable transport conditions now I just have to calibrate the machine. And while I'm calibrating the machine, I'm kind of narrating the video, or at least I attempt to, and honestly, I I'm all over the place, and I'm not making much sense, so I'm going to have to do uh, some corrections. But more importantly, while I'm calibrating the machine, the VU meter that I am working off of, and that I'm explaining and talking about, it's literally got the biggest glare in the world in it. Like, y y you can't believe how bad it ruins the video. And I'm gonna, I don't know, I'm gonna have to figure out some way to demonstrate what was happening. Not only that, but my camera keeps going out of focus for no reason at all. I apologize, this video should be better put together, but it is what it is. Okie dokie, folks. Now we're gonna go on to roughly calibrating this cassette deck, and we're gonna do it the... Uh, half-assed kind of garage way, so to speak. You know, I don't have a proper reference cassette tape to properly calibrate this deck, but what we're going to do today is going to be good enough for our purposes, and you will be able to do this at home easily. Oh, boy. I bought brand new tape. Brand new. And this is type 2 tape. And I've never actually recorded on Type 2 tape. I usually just use the cheapo Type 1. But for home recording purposes, you're really going to want to use Type 2 or the other Type 3 and Type 4. Make sure to calibrate your cassette deck that you'll be doing your mix downs to with the tape that you will be using. And also, depending on what type of cassette deck you have, you will have to change some settings depending on which tape you're using. There is a EQ button down here and there's also a bias button down here that I will have to set accordingly for this type of tape. For in this instance for this type 2 tape I am going to be using high bias option paired along with the 70 microseconds EQ. And there's only going to be three different adjustments that you make in a cassette deck at least the low-end cassette decks that I have. I, there might be better ones out there to have more adjustments but usually it's just the bias level the record gain and the playback gain. And today, since we don't have a proper reference tape, we're not going to touch the playback at all. We're just going to assume the playback on here is set up correctly. And, you know, I already did a rough test when, you know, in the, the video earlier where I just put a random cassette in there and was looking at the meters, and everything seems to be right about at the same playback level in comparison to the left channel and the right channel. And for that reason, I'm just, I'm not even going to touch it. There's no way for me to properly do it without a reference tape. So I'm just going to assume the playback is good. So that leaves us to do to two different adjustments. We have the bias level and the record gain. And the first thing we're going to mess with is the bias level. And we're going to start with 
the left channel. Usually when you're uh, calibrating a stereo tape deck or a cassette deck, you want to start with the left channel solely, work on that channel, get that channel squared away, and then you move on to the right channel. You don't want to waste your time doing both at the same time. And enough talking, let's just get into it. So let's put this tape in. I'm going to fast forward a little bit just to get into somewhat the middle of the tape. All right, that's good enough. I'm going to zero out the tape meter or the tape counter. Okay, so we are going to do this in the simplest way possible. And since cassettes are so simple in nature and very limited, the process can be simple in itself. So we are going to feed two separate um, frequency signals to this tape. And we are going to record it onto the tape and then play back and see what levels we are getting. The first frequency you want to be towards the lower end of your sound spectrum that you're going to be recording on to tape. So on my mixing desk, you're going to be using the 100 hertz uh, frequency oscillator. And then you want to do the same thing for the upper end of your cassette. And on this control deck, I have a 10K setting for my frequency oscillator. So we're going to be using a 10K signal. And really the goal here is to get the lower end and the higher end of the frequency spectrum to be relatively even on record and then playback. You don't want to record your sample material and the high end is boosted and the low end is lowered. Likewise, you don't want your lower end to be higher and you don't want your higher end to be low. And in order to change the frequency response of your cassette deck, you're going to adjust this with your bias level. And this is much different than a proper tape machine. There's going to be other adjustments to make for this. But on a cassette deck, you're just going to worry about the bias level. So let's first start off by recording the 100 hertz frequency onto this cassette deck, onto the left channel. And we are going to set the levels at negative 10 dB on the VU meters. Okay, so the, my control desk is sending a 100 hertz signal to the left channel of my cassette deck, and I have the level at negative 10 dB. And when you're doing cassettes, when you do this adjustment, you always want to do it at negative 10, dB, negative 10 dB as opposed to zero on the VU meters as you would normally do on a tape machine. So let's record some, let's record, let's say about 10 seconds of the signal onto the tape. We are recording, and then once about 10 seconds or so is recorded onto this tape, we are going to feed the 10K signal to the tape at the same level, and then we'll do a playback of both signals. All right, so now let's do the 10K. All right, we are now recording the 10K. My tape counter is working, so that's good. And as I said, the goal here is upon playback, we want the output level of both frequencies to be the same level. And it's important to note that we don't necessarily want these signals yet to be both at negative 10 B on playback. Let's just say the 100K uh, signal is playing at negative 20 we would also hope that the 10K is playing at negative 20 dB on the V muters as well. We just want them to be even, and then once we get them even, we will adjust the record level from there and get it so the level upon recording and playback is the same. All right, so let's see what we get. So we're getting about negative 20 dB on each. Okay, and then for 10K, we're looking at about 8 dB audio level upon playback. Keep in mind, I am reading this upside down. 
Okay, so our higher frequencies are being recorded at a higher level than our lower frequencies. In order to combat this, we are going to raise the bias level very slightly and hope that it takes care of the issue. So I'm going to make a very small adjustment on the bias, and we're going to do the same test again and see what we get. And keep in mind that when I make my adjustment on the bias level, I have no idea which direction is actually raising the bias level and which direction is lowering the bias level. I'm just making the assumption that clockwise is raising it, and it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, when I do my second test, I'm seeing how both frequencies are responding, so I'll know whether I'm going on the right track. Okay, so I made a very tiny adjustment. Let's try again. Once again, we're feeding a 100 hertz signal at negative 10 dB on the VU meters. And now we're going to do the same for 10K. And on cassette decks that only have two heads and a race head and a record slash play head. This is a pain in the ass because you have to keep recording, rewinding, recording, rewinding, adjustment, adjustment. Whereas on a three head machine, like on a proper tape machine, you can make adjustments while you're recording the signals if you're monitoring from the playback head. And, you know, as I said, it's a pain in the ass having to rewind and can make adjustments and go back, make another adjustment. Okay, let's see what effect our adjustment had on recording playback response. Okay, so now it's at about negative 15 dB, so it went up a little, uh, about 5 dB. And the 10K signal is still high, so we're going to have to do more adjustment to get the um, the lower end higher and the the higher end lower so that they're even. This time I made a, a much bigger adjustment to see if I'm actually having effect on the recording levels. So I'm still getting similar effects. I'm just going to keep making adjustments, and hopefully I start to see some results. I made a really big adjustment that time. There is something I'm just realizing when I'm editing this video that I did not realize when I was recording it. The adjustment I am making to the bias is not actually changing the bias level of the recorded signal. The knob on the front of the cassette deck actually sets this bias signal to a preset value. Whereas the adjustment I am actually making is changing the inductance of the record circuit. The technicalities of this adjustment isn't actually all that important. The important thing to note is that I'm using this as a high frequency adjustment for my playback response. Okay, so I actually got the levels to be the same upon playback for both the 100 and the 10K. They're both about negative 15 upon playback. And, uh, you know, I'm sending a negative 10 um, signal. So that means I'm going to have to raise the record level by 5 dB now. I'm going to adjust the record gain. And once again, just do an iterative process until I could get the record gain to match um, from the input level to the output level. And I'm pretty sure you're supposed to do this adjustment at 0 VU this time and not at the negative, T, uh, negative 10 um, mark on the VU meter. So I'm going to raise the level here. And this time we will be recording a 1 kilohertz reference tone. And that is because we are no longer interested in the outer extremes of our recording frequency response. We're more looking at the middle of the frequencies and we're going to get the gain calibration values from there.
So actually, when I did the test with the 1K, it was actually pretty spot on. So I don't even think I'm going to touch the record level. Okay, so the left channel is Mario certified good enough, and we're going to move on to the right channel. And I already know from prior tests with the left channel that this channel is going to need a little more work. The 100 hertz tone has a similar playback response as the left channel, but the 10 kilohertz response on the right channel is negative 3 dB. So we have a lot of turning to do, and during my process, I almost completely top out the adjustment of the inductor. And you can see in this close-up shot how much the inductor to the right has its adjustment screw coming out. So after a few iterations of the calibration process, I got the right channel to be, once again, Mario certified good enough. I did some test recordings with some of my own material and compared the pre-cassette version to the post-cassette version and honestly I am pretty impressed with this machine. I was expecting way worse and for my purposes it's going to do me just fine. And I know the calibration process that I did today on this cassette deck is really rudimentary but the point is, is I got something usable with just doing some really basic calibration steps. You don't need any fancy equipment to do this type of stuff. All you really need is a tone generator of some sorts, and you could use a cell phone for that purpose. Okay, I'm going to end this video with doing an A-B comparison of a mix down pre and post going to the cassette deck. Thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed.